Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Chris Audland as she reviews the leading zirconia block options from Dents by Serona and how they can add unique advantages and efficiencies to your practice. Tonight's webinar is also sponsored by Dents by Serona. If anyone has a question, please drop it in the Q&A section, and we'll get an answer back to you as quickly as possible. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending tonight's presentation live or on demand. Dr. Odland, welcome. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, happy 2-2 two -two of 22. I always love things like that, the fun dates. Um, hopefully, you guys are having a good day, and if you are listening to the recording, I hope you had a great 2-2 two -two of 22. Big shout out to Henry Shine and Dentsply Serona. Thank you so much for hosting me. I always love to talk shop and talk Sarek and um, all the things that go with that, so I'm just very honored to be here. So little bit of background on me. So I went to school in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Health Science University, graduated in 2006. 2006 wasn't a really big time in digital dentistry. Um, there wasn't a lot of exposure in school to CEREC technology, but I had the opportunity for a great associateship. He had had a second practice that he was looking to bring a doctor into, and he had all the toys. He was chartless, which was a big deal then. He had digital x-rays, and then he had this um, suspicious machine called a CEREC, and <laughs> we're going to talk about that obviously throughout, but um, I just fell in love with what it did with the patients and that patient's response. So I always knew I wanted to have my own practice, and I did a startup back in 2009, and then a couple years ago bought a second practice, and I have the honor to work with two other doctors in my main practice where I work and then I have a full-time associate in the other practice. Both practices are very digitally forward and it's been fun to bring in new docs and also have them geek out on the technology and learn it. And then I spend my spare time down in Tempe, Arizona, doing some live patient education at Pathway. Uh, a lot of people know it as Implant Pathway, where we do implant training, but I'm bringing in the clinical component and teaching some CEREC. So we do our same day smile classes and implant restorations. And what I love about it is we get real life situations. It's not type of work whatsoever. Um, it's, it's more of the work that we would find in our own clinics, but the patients were given back to. And so we get to do some good while we're learning and teaching. Um, and there's a residency program there through NYU. So I get to help out with the AGD program and also share my love for technology. Pretty much it just means I'm a huge, huge nerd and love dentistry. And then my side hobby, I like to create dental spoofs. It's kind of just this fun, wacky thing. My office is always just running around doing TikToks and giggling and rewriting songs. So we like to have fun. But the theme of my life all the way around, but especially my dental life, and my team would tell you, as well as my teaching world, is that the only thing that is constant is change. And I just, I find that quote so true, especially if you're in the technology world, because there's always things coming out, there's always materials coming out, and trying to stay on top of that, and um, that's what keeps me going. I love it. I have the opportunity to work with several different companies um, and do some beta testing and testing out different materials and uh, it's been a great ride. I think the reason I get asked is because I'm brutally honest with how I feel and how it fits into my practice. We have a pretty busy practice um, that I will explain here in a little bit um, and it needs to work in the real world and so I really enjoy working with the different companies that I do and it's really important for me to let you know that I'm not ever going to speak on something that I'm not going to use in my own practice with my own patients. So I mentioned in my associateship uh, back in 2006, this was my first introduction to the CEREC machine. And this is back in the red cam days, so much different than our touch screen and prime scan today. And uh, there's lots of clicks and buttons. Um, there wasn't a lot of material options back then either. This is mostly Feldspathic porcelains. Um, 
what I liked about it is as a young doctor coming into a practice, I can't tell you how many times patients would say, oh, are you even old enough to be my dentist? And, you know, people ask all the time, how many times have you done this? And you just kind of chuckle it off or, you know, however you want to respond to that. But when they saw how I could use the CEREC machine after I had some training on it, it kind of gave me a little bit of instant authority. And the patients thought it was really cool and they really, really liked that they could come in for one single visit. Because these are busy times. It's always busy times, whether it's today or or before. And we're definitely in some uh, working town. So in this case, I was about 20 minutes outside of Portland, Oregon, and it was a little bit, it sounds kind of funny, but it was actually a little bit kind of rural, and taking time off isn't easy for anybody. So when we could deliver that restoration, excuse me, restoration, it was awesome for everybody involved. The other thing, I was really nervous because Sarah didn't always have the best reputation, <laughs> and I didn't want to be known for having bad work or ugly crowns. And that was kind of what everyone thought of at the time with Sarah. And I pulled these x rays off the internet, off one of the Facebook groups. A doctor had posted it, and everyone instantly jumped on him. Oh, this is why Sarah doctors are bad. This is why Sarah is awful. And I loved this post because the doctor was pointing out there's, of course, these open margins in here, but they are definitely not Sarah crowns these are all lab made crowns and you know before my biggest competition was a pfm that's what i was trained on and kind of what crowns were happening at the time and so when someone saw a full porcelain crown they just assumed it was a same day crown or a ceric but what this really shows is that the ceric is purely just a tool and if you put bad data in you will get bad data out. Just like if you take a bad impression and there's tissue in the way or blood or whatever, you are going to get bad data out. No difference in there. And I just, I thought that was so powerful. And I would tell you that any CEREC doctor will also probably tell you that it is a very humbling piece of equipment, especially when your preps are blown up so big. And if you can take ownership in your work, which I love to do, if I have something break, I want to investigate and learn why. And I, especially early in my career, definitely, I didn't have a respect for materials and I didn't have a respect for my preps. I just didn't know any better. I love that phrase, you don't know what you don't know. And um, it's definitely been a great journey along the way. So early in my career, we were doing a lot of feldspathic porcelains and I went through everything. I had crowns of breaks, so I was only gonna do premolars and I was terrified of anteriors. And then you kind of get to a point when you're talking to patients, you have to explain why you're gonna send some to the lab and why you're gonna keep the rest in house. And so at that point, I didn't really wanna explain that to my patients. So I just wanted to really deep dive into the education side and I have fallen in love with it. The other part of my work history is I went to work for corporate dentistry. I did this for one year. I worked six days a week and just absolutely worked my tail off because I wanted to learn systems. Be despite what you think of corporate dentistry, uh, yay or nay, there's a lot of good that happens. Um, and you know, just like every practice, there's also some not great, but what they have in place is they know how to do systems, work efficiently and make money. And knowing that I wanted to open my own practice, I wanted to get all the knowledge I possibly could. Now I actually love seeing how a lot of the corporate offices are incorporating CAD CAM and digital dentistry because I think it's where the future's going. So in 2009, I took a leap and I decided to build my own practice, um, took out some pretty big dollars. I started with CEREC, I started with CBCT, I built out three operatories with room to grow. Um, I built the building and always knew I wanted to have other tenants in there, I wanted to have other colleagues to work with. And you know, in your 20s, this is very scary, but I needed to succeed. 2009 was the first year that we actually had dentists in our town going bankrupt and walking away from their practices. It's when Delta cut their fees by 25%. And so how is I going to break those barriers? Today, this is what my practice looks like. So today I'm at nine ops. I work with two other doctors. We have anywhere from four to five hygiene. And that's my dog. He comes to work with me every day. And I knew this was going to be my home away from home. And so I really wanted to build something that I was comfortable in. But it's been a journey to get there. So how did I break those barriers? 
Well, for me, I decided to accept PPOs, which I know the dream is always to get to that fee for service practice, but in my town, the average family income is about $50,000. We have a lot of big industry that are PPO only. So my 10 top employers in town have PPO only dental insurance. And so I wanted to look into that. And then I knew with my systems and efficiencies, I could, I could make it work. And I was determined to do that. I had to create systems. I had to use my team. I had to trust my technology. There's nothing more frustrating than when you buy expensive technology and it sits in the corner. And then I created this culture of single visit dentistry. So in my town in Vancouver, Washington, which is 15 minutes outside of Portland, when I opened my practice in 2009, I had 79 dentists to compete with. It was huge and I needed to set myself apart. Sarek wasn't super popular at that point and I wanted to use technology and digital dentistry to be that thing that was gonna set me apart. And creating this culture of single visit didn't just apply to doing single visit crowns. I mean, certainly that's what it meant for me at the beginning, but it also meant taking care of the patient as a whole and taking care of those emergencies. And it's a way that I was able to grow my practice pretty quick. But the journey with Sarek has been, um, it's been a journey. I don't know if I have another word for that. <laughs> you definitely have to stay on top of the different materials and the different choices. and. I had mentioned before when I started back in 2006, we didn't have a lot of material choices. There were some composite blocks and then there were these feldspathic porcelains and lucite reinforced porcelains. So this is your Empress and your Vita. They're beautiful, beautiful blocks, not super strong. Look great in the anterior, but are you gonna use it on a second molar? I know lots of dentists that did and they're still in there and as long as you respect the material and your preps they can work fantastic um, i'm still to this day 15 years in practice and under reducer <laughs> so for me finding some blocks that were a little stronger um, just gave me a little bit of peace of mind so then some blocks came on the market uh, the game changer for me when i incorporated Zarek into my practice and my startup was emax it had a lot higher strength. It was double the strength of the feldspathic porcelains and also still a glass ceramic that was beautiful. Now today there's zirconia reinforced lithium silicates and then also these ceramic hybrids. And I always have to remember when I have new team members especially coming in to to train them on all the different materials because you know if you have these ceramic hybrids they're great I love these for inlays and onlays um, but they don't go in the oven they're really fast <laughs> but sometimes I uh, have forgotten to tell new team members that they don't go in the oven and it will definitely put your lab in on fire we had to call the fire department once which is kind of a sad day makes a very stinky mess um, but my point is you just have to stay on top of the blocks there's so many blocks coming out on the market because CAD CAM and same day dentistry is becoming so popular and so knowing what those blocks are and then the other game changer was zirconia so zirconia became a really popular restoration and to me it kind of felt like overnight all of a sudden everyone was doing them um, there it's a lot more affordable material which is great when the gold prices went up especially lab bills when I started I would pay like two to three fifty per unit and today you can get a beautiful zirconia restoration for like less than a hundred bucks which is awesome it flooded the market and so today's market it's 79 percent of zirconia restorations so of course in our chair side world that trend had to come along and and we had one zirconia material to start with, the Serona and Chorus material. And then now there's lots of different zirconias coming out. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on today. If you would have told me five years ago that I would be using zirconia all over the mouth and even in the anteriors, I probably would have laughed because I didn't personally love zirconia. I was super comfortable with glass ceramics. Um, I just didn't think zirconia was pretty enough, but we have come so far. Not all zirconias are the same. So this STML means super translucent. And it, just an easy way to remember is the prettier the zirconia is, typically the weaker strength it is. So Katana, I think, is right around 763. The um, Serona zirconia 
uh, is about a thousand. So you kind of have to decide for yourself what is strong enough for you. Um, I think I've heard in a couple of lectures that dentists always like to have that tall bar syndrome that stronger is always better, but is it? Is it always better? That's something that's kind of personal to answer. One of the things that I really wanted to figure out though especially when I'm coming into the CEREC world is I told you earlier my competition was PFM. Well, what it, what's comparable to a PFM? And I was shocked to find that the PFM was only 250 strength for MPAs. And it's not because of the metal underneath. The metal underneath, everyone knows when you cut them off, they're pretty strong for the most part, but it's that interface between the porcelain and the metal. And when you have that fracture, is that a failure? Well, it certainly can be depending where it fractured. So again, that's our competition and we're just knocking it out of the park these days. But materials, we talked about this a little bit earlier, we just definitely have to respect them. Some you fire, some you can fire or polish, some are only polish, some you etch, some you sandblast, and then where do you put them? So this is just my personal chart. I have this in my lab. Um, I thought this would help my team members just remember, oh, okay, if we're using, say, the GC Sarah Smart Block, make sure we don't put it in the oven. And then I quickly realized that some team members are visual and want that chart, but other team members just want pictures. And so I have both. Um, I really love spreadsheets and making charts like this, and I'm happy to share any of them. So my contact information, I'll give it to you at the end of the presentation. But if you want any of this, please just ask. I'm an open book when it comes to it. But it's just that constant reminder that not all materials are the same. And that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves and team members because we don't want this to happen. If all of a sudden you're going down this path and you have a bunch of restorations fracturing, that's kind of annoying for everyone, both the patient and the team and yourself. It's just more time out of the practice um, that you could be doing other things. And so no one wants to go through that. And I definitely do like to keep things as simple as possible. So let's talk about why zirconia. So of course when zirconia came out, I wanted to try it because I am a huge geek and I loved checking out the new materials. But why would I wanna switch or why would I wanna carry zirconia in my practice when I'm super comfortable with the glass ceramics that I'm using? Well, it has high strength, so of course for those big bruxers, the people that just grind everything down, that's a little bit of peace of mind. Second molars, I can get on with that precision. So the cool thing about zirconia is it's milled out a lot larger than any other restorations. It's milled out about 23 to 25% bigger. So when it comes out of the mill, you cannot try it in, in the chalk state. A, it's too big and it's also just too soft. It kind of looks like a horse's tooth. It's huge. Um, it's fun to show the patients because they really enjoy <laughs> seeing that. And the precision comes in the fact that you have smaller burrs on one side doing the anatomy, but then also you have that shrinkage that's going to fit better. The soft tissue response is beautiful. I tend to do a lot of polish only for my zirconias, and polish, or I'm sorry, tissue doesn't always like glaze in particular. Um, so polished zirconia, I've just really noticed a big difference of tissue if it's going to be subgingival, especially in the back popularity. I feel like as, uh, as I'm working with more and more younger docs coming out um, and associates coming in, zirconia, just people love it. And so to have that available as a restoration that we can still do chair side has been great. And then beauty. So this is one I really struggled with because I hadn't seen how zirconia could be beautiful unless you layered other materials on top of it like porcelains but then of course that takes a lot of time so is it pretty well this is what we started out with <laughs> so the first Cerex zirconia that came out uh, we had all sorts of calculations on how we were going to shade match it was pretty funny um, this is an a3 polish only you can see it's pretty bright and pretty flat we would have all these rules if it was you know a little brown we would do a d4 and i don't know it just it got complicated we used to mill out our own so we had our own kind of shade guide they weren't 
very true to the Vita classic. Um, and they just, we ended up calling these white gold. They were so bright in the mouth, so opaque in the mouth that we wanted to warn the patients. They didn't blend in quite as well as the glass ceramics. Um, but strength-wise, they're a 1,000 MPA. Like, they're very, very strong, which is great. So I wanted to talk to a friend of mine. This is Sean Hans, Magic Hand here, sitting here, about how I could make these prettier because I I did like using them as especially for second molars or big bruxers, but I just couldn't stand how opaque they were. And so he drew me this little map. If you ever see Sean at a conference, he is super easy to talk to. He owns a great lab down in Arizona, um, but he carries these big teeth and highlighters to show you the maps of how to make a tooth look natural. And so he drew this out for me. Highlighter yellow is going to be your whites and your creams, the cuss tips that are always a little bit white. The blue highlighter is going to be your translucency. So these are your grays and your lavenders or blue. And then you have your chroma at the occlusal table and that's what kind of gives the restoration a little depth. And when we started with the zirconia, uh, this is we were doing a lot of infiltration, which we would use these marker pens and infiltrate a liquid into the zirconia still in its chalk state to give it a little bit of depth and color. And so this is what it looked like, and it definitely added a little bit of characterization. So not bad at all, gave some depth. But the hard part is, is once you infiltrate it in that chalk state, you can't just polish it off if you mess up. So if you mess up badly, then you have to remill, which is kind of a bummer. The other hard part is it took a lot more time not time in using it as far as doing the infiltration on the restoration in the chalk state, but time in the sintering process. So we try to dry mill all of the zirconia because the sintering process is so much faster. But if you wet mill or if you incorporate any moisture, you're almost doubling, you're over doubling the time a lot of times with this pre-drying and then sintering. And 15 plus minutes can be a big difference chair side. So then when I started infiltrating, if I really wanted to make it look pretty, then I would add some stain and glaze. Now the only reason I'd ever really want to do this is if I'm showing it up on a big screen. My patients really don't care all that much. They just kind of want it to blend in. But I just had this challenge of could I make it look really pretty? So can I add stain and glaze? Yes, I can. The nice part about the stain and glaze over it is if I really mess up I can polish that off um, but if I infiltrated it then I would have to remill because I can't polish off the infiltration but if I'm doing both infiltration and stain glaze here all of a sudden I'm looking at 30 minutes of sintering and then an additional 12 minutes of glazing so now I am getting additional strength but I'm also adding a lot of chair time and chair time matters the game changer though for zirconia chairside for me was when Katana Zirconia block came out. And this is that super translucent multi-layered block and it is beautiful. So 763 in its strength, um, so it was less than a thousand, still a little bit more than Emacs and you know those are kind of the day-to-day -day comparisons and so it gave me a lot of comfort knowing it was a stronger block for those second molars and it blended in so much better. So super translucent, so again the higher the translucency typically the weaker the zirconia. And this was my first katana that I had just done a polish only. You can see it blends in beautifully. So now all of a sudden this block right here became the standard against any other zirconia blocks that were coming out. Could they be as pretty as this one? The sintering time was 18 minutes, a little over 18 minutes. It did depend on thickness a little bit. So if I had a restoration that was over six millimeters in thickness, then it was a little bit higher in my time. So going up to a 30 minute sintering time. And then the other game changer that came out with Zirconia was the Prime Mill. So the Prime Mill launched a few years ago and we were we knew something was coming out, didn't know what. So when they said it was a mill, it was like, oh, you know, you can only get so excited about a mill. Um, not quite as sexy as the software or the Prime Scan. But all of a sudden when we could see that you could mill a Zirconia restoration in less than five minutes, now that was a game changer that's going to make a pretty big impact on your practice. Patients love watching this. 
they think it's so cool that you can make a crown in less than five minutes. And now with the software designs being so fast in just a couple minutes and the scanning so fast, I can definitely get my appointments down to an hour or just over an hour, depending on how much I talk, which I tend to chat a lot with my patients. So, so all of a sudden for my same day restorations, so this was being very generous in my time, an hour and 25 minutes, but um, you can see like preparing the patient, obviously it doesn't have to take 15 minutes. I can prep a tooth typically in five minutes, not 15 minutes. Um, but you can realistically get this done in an hour and a half. I get asked questions all the time in scheduling patients, and what I would tell you is if you were not doing CEREC before, your goal is to do your prep and your seat appointment combined. So if you, if this is prior to CEREC and you used to do an hour and a half prep appointment and then a half hour seat appointment, you would want your CEREC appointment to be two hours from start to finish. But with the new materials and the new advancements in milling and design and everything, I think you can even beat that. So what about new blocks on the market? What would make me want to change or even look at new blocks? Well, this beautiful block came out, the Seric MTL, um, not too long ago. So I am pretty new at this block. I've used it um, a handful of times and I've actually been really impressed. So it is a little bit stronger but what I really like about this block is the design parameters. So in a block like Katana or other zirconias, you typically have to have about a millimeter thickness, but this one we're down to 0.6. If you're gonna super fast, they do recommend you're at 0.7, but still, this is, this is good. You can be a lot more conservative on this, both in your crowns and your bridges. So I just want to walk through a case. So here's just an everyday tooth that's coming in the door, recurrent decay, cracks, pain on release on a cusp, time for a crown. So we prep, we get rid of this, the amalgam in there, any recurrent decay, do a buildup if necessary. My margins you can see are thick on one side because we had to do removal with the amalgam, but pretty thin on the buckle, which I like because with the zirconia, I feel like you could definitely be pretty conservative on those margins. And then we get our design. Designs these days are so fast. I personally like to stay in my royal blue for my occlusion. And then boom, it is time to mill. So fun tip that I totally stole from somebody. I don't even know who I stole it from, but I like to also share so everyone else can steal. Uh, the tip is I like to design in the room. Um, at the beginning, if you're nervous to designing, it's nice to wheel out the CEREC, but if the patient can watch you design the tooth, they think it's pretty cool. And then I have them push the start button, the manufacture button, because then they take that ownership and they get to feel like they made the crown. So you can either have them push start on the actual mill if they want to watch the mill, or you can have them push start on the prime scan or whatever CEREC you have but them taking that ownership is huge and so even if the shade is just a tiny bit off a lot of times like they they don't care because they're just so excited that they got to make that tooth it's pretty fun here it is milled so in this case it took about five minutes pretty fast you can see a little bit of striations on there because we did super fast instead of just the regular fast milling but with five minutes um I'm not going to give up that time. It's easy for me to just polish that out. So for my polishing, I it is a chalk state, and so it is a little bit different than porcelains if you haven't worked with zirconia before. So I just put this kit together because I wanted my Emacs burrs separate from my zirconia burrs. So I have my Emacs burrs laid out to the left, my zirconia burrs laid out to the right-hand side. You can see that little line dividing it. And this sounds so silly, but um, I have an amazing, amazing team who also had a talent for getting like those twist polishers caught in the margins of the chalk state of zirconia. And so when I put this burr kit together, I really wanted my zirconia burrs to only be points because it was a little bit easier to use and a lot less accidents of the burrs, um, or I'm sorry, of the crowns flying across the room or breaking. So I like the points for the pre-polish and post-polish. And this is what it looks like. So being kind of an early adopter and testing out materials, we 
made the mistake of separating the crown from the block, so um, removing the sprue with a wheel. And you can still use a wheel if you're really careful, but just as an example, this was what was happening with us. So the crowns don't fall in the mill like they do with a lot of the glass ceramics, because if they fall on their own, they can chip. And what we're finding with the wheel is sometimes they can chip because it's a little bit softer, much easier. So instead of using the wheel, we like to use this pointed diamond and you're always having your hand under there so you can catch it. We also have a towel under there because we have a granite surface um, that if it falls, it can definitely break. And it will only fall and break with that cranky patient or if you're running behind, it just never fails. And then I use a carbide burr to remove the sprue. You wanna respect the RPMs. You don't wanna crank these up super high. You definitely wanna have them around five to 8,000 RPM and you don't need a lot of pressure. A couple other things, I'm always wearing gloves when I am working with zirconia. We had some zirconia crowns that all of a sudden were coming out of the oven and they were cracking and we couldn't figure out why. And one of my assistants hated the feel of zirconia, so she would wash her hands before and then she would wash her hands right after. But washing her hands before, she wouldn't dry her hands all the way and she was incorporating water into those crowns. And so then as she was going through the sintering process, we just did sinter, not pre-dry and sinter. And that water, even that little bit of water incorporation was causing fractures. So we all use gloves now, it's what we do. And then you can see because it's so Ch uh, chalky and dusty we wear masks too just in case and then here's the point burr that I was talking about and we just do a quick pre-polish and this just gets rid of any of those striations and then it helps diminish the opalescence that if you get a high sheen or high polish of zirconia at the end it can cause and then we want to remove all the debris. So in my lab, I have an air um, that's also air abrade, but there's no water incorporated into the line. Again, no moisture. Moisture is bad if you're going to dry mill. But I want to get rid of any of the little dust particles because if you don't, it's going to get baked into that final restoration. So you can use a brush or you can use an air. And then you want to put it upside down. So you're going to put it on the occlusal table, no putty and then put it into the speed fire or if you have a cs6 and then our centering time is anywhere from 18 minutes and 48 seconds to 25 minutes and 52 seconds and with this particular block it depends on the shade when you get the restoration out you want to air braid it so aluminum oxide 30 to 50 microns and then you want to steam clean it just to get rid of any of those dust particles and then we're ready to go into the mouth and try it in. Now I personally, I bond everything, so we use Dry Shield or Isolite in every op. For me it's just great. It's good cheek retraction, keeps the tongue out of the way. For me it has a light, has suction, and it just makes such a difference in efficiency. I have three doctors in my practice. We run with four assistants, so we run pretty lean. And this also frees up a lot of my assistant time, which is awesome, so if they have if they forgot something or need to go do something, then they have this availability. After I try it in, then I want to use a cleaner. And so I use either the IvaClean from IvaClar or the Katana Cleaner, and that just gets rid of all the adhesion inhibitors or saliva really is what it does. Now, if I tried it in before I sandblasted, then I would just try it in the mouth then go back to my lab and sandblast, or if you have a chair side sandblaster, you wouldn't have to do this step. And then one of my favorite things in the office is so funny because it's this little plastic thing. It's kind of like a post-it note, like one of my very favorite <laughs> supplies. Um, this is called Etch Ease. And what this does, you put it on your high vac and you put your crown in it and then you can wash off whatever material. So if you're etching porcelain for crowns or if you're removing the katana cleaner, whatever you need to do, you just put it in this little suction and 
and rinse it and then uh, the crown isn't gonna bounce all over. So I would love to tell you that it's never happened where the crown has got sucked up in the suction, but it's definitely happened in my practice, or they would rinse it over the tray um, at the 12 o'clock station and then water would be everywhere and just get so messy. I just hated that so much. So I had seen this in a lecture and then bought some and now I just swear by them. I love these little etchies for rinsing my crayons out. And then the beauty of zirconian, what so many people love about it, is you can either do conventional cementation or you can do a self-adhesive resin. And I think this is such a doctor's preference. So for me, I don't like to have a lot of different materials in my office, and so I try, I just bond everything. And these new self-adhesive resin cements have just been amazing. So check to make sure if it is a self-adhesive resin cement or if you need to bond with it. Um, or again, if you like any of those resin modified glass ionomers, then you can do that and you're not going to lose strength. So here it is seated. You can see this is a polish only and it blends in great. So I told you before, like what is our kind of gold standard at this point in the zirconia world for aesthetics is the katana. So here's an A3 Ceric MTL next to a, a katana A3 and I think they blend pretty well. They look good. This is definitely the closest material that I've seen to katana. But what if things don't go perfect? What if my shade is off? Then what can I do? So here are some restorations I'm going to be replacing 13, 14, and 15. She has some old PFMs with recurrent decay. She has a lot of translucency in her teeth. And so normally my go-to would have actually been porcelain in this, but she has been grinding like crazy and has been going through some of her crowns. And you can see even here with the occlusion, how they're just a little bit flat. So I take off the crowns, I do my buildups, uh, refine my preps. Here's my proposals. All of this is pretty quick these days with auto margination and then the designs just keep getting better and better and better. Spacer wise, I will change my spacer if I am gonna use a resin modified glass ionomer. I'm gonna bump that down to 90. If I have nice smooth preps, it just adds a little bit more retention. If I'm gonna bond it, I leave it at 120. But my favorite part of the parameter is that it's only at 0.6 for my thickness. So I can be more conservative if I wanna be in my reduction and then I go to manufacture I can do the super fast and mill it and here are my restorations so milled out quick polish try them in and oh I totally picked the wrong shade <laughs> and the hard part is she does have so such a gradation such a strong gradation what do I do so I could remill, I could absolutely remill, but remilling three crowns obviously is gonna take some time between the mill and the centering. Or I can do a little stain and glaze. So staining and glazing zirconia is a little different. If you are an Emacs user, make sure you don't use the object fix. You don't need anything that sturdy. You do wanna use something like this Ceric Speed Paste or Indenco makes one too. That's, um, it's kind of like a little fluffy and you don't use it as support as far as it's not doing anything to the integrity of the crown on the inside. You're just using it to support the pin essentially. And I use these little firecrackers I really like the Dense Apply Universal Stains for Zirconia. It's the same stain system that is set up on the Speedfire already for that um, at the bottom when you hit centering and then when it's done it will say either finish the job or you can glaze. So it's that glaze button, it's about nine minutes, that's what it's set up for. So it's pretty simple in the system that I use. I have my glaze liquid on the side and that's how I'm gonna change colors with my brush or if I have anything a little too chunky, that's how I'm gonna make it flow nicely. And I'm gonna use that universal over glaze all over first and then I'm gonna do a little body stain at the gingival and then a little enamel stain at the top. And so here's what it looks like before it goes in the oven. So I have those little firecrackers. You can see a little bit of putty just supporting on the pin. The bottom third, I use that body stain, and the top part, I use that enamel. I use the same pattern for my staining and glazing no matter what I do. So if it's a glass ceramic, if it's zirconia, I paint my overall universal glaze first, and then I will do my body stain, 
and then I will do my enamel stain or translucency and then you can follow that up with like a white halo or a cream halo I don't do that necessarily for all my posteriors but that's another little characterization that you can do and then here's what it looks like seated and you can see it blends in so much better and this was a nine minute fire cycle, so much faster than remilling. So can you add characterization? Absolutely you can. And it turns out beautiful. What are some of the other purposes for zirconia? Here is a patient who came in and I had done an Emax almost 10 years ago on that second molar. And she has needed a lot of dental work, lost a couple teeth, so she's had this flipper forever, keeps thinking she's gonna come in for an implant, but it just hasn't worked out. So I'm sure my reduction was probably a little off on that one, but I wanted to change it out and do zirconia. So excellent case for biocopy. Um, biocopy, obviously, you're missing that distal half, so you don't have to biocopy the whole tooth. You can go around if there's a fractured part. And then I also just want to point out on the buckle, I didn't capture quite enough data on that buckle for number two. And so what you can do is just go around that in your biocopy. If I put my biocopy line through that or in it, a lot of times you can get some kind of wonky proposal back, and this just avoids it and it's gonna take the parts that I don't incorporate in the biocopy and use a bio individual formulation for that to make it look just like a tooth. So here's my biocopy. You can see it stitched it together really well. I try not to add a lot of anatomy back into it because I love anatomy on a crown. I think it's so beautiful, but if she's already ground off the anatomy or if her bite just doesn't like it, then I'm trying to respect how her bite was before. And then you can see that biocopy was just dead on with zirconia. And I feel better. I didn't have to reduce a lot more with that 0.6 thickness. Um, and it's nice and smooth, and she'll be ready for an implant someday when she likes it. But for now, her partials just went down as a snap. It was great. Another purpose that I really like zirconia in general is for bridges, both anterior and posterior. And I like it because your connector size can be just a little bit smaller. So for anteriors, we're looking at a nine millimeter squared connector and in posteriors, a 12 millimeter squared connector. And so here's just a polish only bridge that I did from 29 to 30. On the MCXL, these mill in 18 minutes. Um, at first, if you push mill, I think it says uh, it's like 65 minutes or 45 minutes, but if you wait just a minute or two, all of a sudden that drops down to 18 minutes. So you can still deliver this in a single appointment, which I just, I think is phenomenal. It takes a little bit longer on the prime mill, but, um, but I still, you can deliver it in one day. It's awesome. We still do quite a few bridges in our practice. We do a lot of implants too, but sometimes a bridge is just what's needed. And then can you bond zirconia? This is a question I get asked all the time, especially if you're gonna do any anterior work. So there is a pretty famous paper out there. You can find it on PubMed by Blotz, Dr. Blotz. And he has this APC concept, which means you air braid your zirconia and then you prime it with an MDP primer and then use a resin cement. And his failure rates are super low. He's been bonding for a very long time. And so I read the paper and I only use bonds pretty much as my cement method and so um, I haven't had a lot of D bonds or anything but it was nice to see the paper support it but it was actually this paper that just totally got me excited about bonding zirconia and what this is a 10-year outcome of doing a single winged Maryland bridge and if you've been a CEREC user for a while or or not maybe you're a new CEREC user but if you've ever done a single wing Maryland bridge I would say if you're you know super conservative and just using bonding this is one of the toughest things not just single wing but double wing too because you're relying just on that bond and for me to have a 10-year survival rate of 98.2 percent I thought that was huge and obviously you can bond zirconia with it So this is a case that this woman had come in to see me and she needed a bridge on the left and we were kind of chatting about it. She had seen a couple different providers and just looking at her x-rays, she had a zirconia crown on number six, a porcelain crown on number seven, zirconia on eight and nine, number 10 was porcelain, 
uh, Levin is missing. She had a couple failed implants, and so she, the surgeon just decided it was time for a bridge, and then she had a natural tooth on 12. And so we're looking at this, and she really likes the brightness of zirconia, and she's always hated her laterals because to her they were just a little too dull and too translucent. And so I'm not sure what was used as far as if it is it was Emacs cutting it off, but I don't know what translucency was used in the restorations. But for brightness purposes, I thought, well, I might as well do zirconia and see what happens. Um, if you would have asked me if I would ever use zirconia in the anterior a couple years ago, I would have laughed and said no. <laughs> but now, with the zirconias coming out and the beauty of them, I said yes. And so we delivered a new crown on tooth number seven and that bridge on 10, 11, 12. And I think it blends in great. I was so shocked and so surprised. So can you do zirconia in the anterior? Yes. Can you bond it? Yes. How does it look compared to other materials? We talked about this a little bit um, in showing what it looked like to Katana. And so these are five different examples of blocks. Uh, I milled them all out just to see. So quick disclaimer, zirconia for me is really hard to photograph. <laughs> uh, it's not quite the same. Um, but even with my eye, I was shocked to see how close a lot of these zirconias are starting to look, which is awesome in my mind because they're just becoming more and more beautiful. Um, you can see the middle two, so my third and fourth crown over from the left. I totally cut those cusps off on accident. What I also found in doing this is zirconias are not all the same. Some are softer than others, even in the chalk state. And so you do have to be careful in that pre-polish. If, if you push a little bit too hard, you can definitely either take a contact out or ruin the anatomy. And in that middle one, that's what it looks like if you leave a little bit of debris on there. So apparently I didn't brush off all of the debris using my air or a brush before I put it in the centering unit. So I wanted to leave it in so you can see that chalky state. Can I polish it out? Yes. Um, that particular restoration was a little bit harder to polish than the others. And it didn't matter to me which one was which. What I thought was so fascinating was that they're all looking pretty good these days, which is awesome. And this is, I have the MTL on the right hand side, just as blown up next to one of my other very favorite zirconia blocks. And, and again, like there's some very subtle differences here, but a lot of people, I don't think you'd be able to notice quite as much in the mouth. So that's good, we're getting there. So then what are the other things that you would look at? Like what would make you look at changing a block out? Well, one thing is cost. Most of the blocks themselves are about the same price. And if you are gonna compare that, definitely make sure you're looking at what, how many come in a box, because some come with three, some come with five. And so break that down per unit. But I would say most of the zirconia blocks are pretty close in the same neighborhood. What I was kind of shocked to find is, if you're doing a lot of milling, um, some of the harder zirconias you're going to go through your burrs a little bit faster. So does that matter as the cost per mill? Well, if you start paying attention to how much you're paying for burrs, it actually it starts to add up. So with our prime mill burrs, you're milling with the 1.0 CS, which is about $41 per burr. Um, and with the 2.5, it's about 93 per burr. So if you can get more mills out of it, then yeah, those burrs can add up quick. With the MCXL burrs, they're about $71 per burr. So cost per unit can be big. And what it really can mean is some of those harder materials, it is a 1% burr life versus a 4% burr life, which is pretty significant. So I would love to tell you, we're trying to do a study in our office, or not quite a study, but just kind of pay attention in our office of how many more mills we could get. We definitely felt like we got more mills with the softer zirconias, which was awesome. We unfortunately um, interchanged our materials a little too much to get a definitive, you know, 1% versus 4%. But we, this is something we're starting to pay attention to for sure. So why zirconia? High strength. The precision. <coughs> excuse me. The soft tissue response popularity of it and the beauty of it and we are just getting more beautiful and more beautiful 
if you're ever interested in life patient education, this is something that we love to do. We definitely try out different materials and while we're giving back, changing smiles, whether it's with implant restorations or same day smile designs with the CEREC, it's, it's a very, very fun day and very life transforming. And that is all I got. So thank you so much for paying attention. And if you have any questions, please email me or find me on Instagram. I am always happy to geek out and share anything I have. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Audlin. Always a pleasure to have you lecture for us. And thank you everyone for attending tonight. Everyone in attendance will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. And if anyone is interested in attending future webinars, visit henryshinedental.com webinars for our upcoming schedule. Thanks for attending, everyone. Have a great night.